On today's episode, we're going to review what happened in Crown Jewel in Saudi Arabia, which some great things that took place. We get the crown, a queen's crown, king of the ring, and also who win out of the championships from Raw Tag Team Championship, the WWE title, the Women's SmackDown title, and of course, the Universal title, and some other matches you definitely don't want to miss. We're also going to review AEW Rampage, where we have the first opening round for the AEW World Title Eliminator, starting with Orange Cassidy and, of course, uh, Powerhouse Hobbs, and, of course, a non-title match between Britt Baker and Anna J. and many other things. Also, 205 Live, and I'm also going to review a past event from the early August by Pro Wrestling Noah, Crossover 2022 in Hiroshima. So, let's get started with another episode of the Leader Retro Zone. Welcome everybody to Deleted WrestleZone, all things that is pro wrestling with AEW, NXT, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Impact Wrestling, the National Wrestling Alliance, various promotions, wrestlers, matches, and championships. I am your host, Jay right here. So, now I know some of you are going to say, wait a minute, Jay, I thought you don't watch Raw or SmackDown or W. I only watch NXT 205 Live or NXT UK. However, there are pay-per-views I will watch if there's certain ones. Like, Crown Jewel is one of them. And that is one I cannot miss. Okay? So, don't criticize me. Don't judge me. That's how I feel. Okay? It's my perspective. But if you do have a problem with it, you know, not reviewing Raw or SmackDown, just leave a comment down below. And I'll explain to you guys at the end of the episode why I don't do it. But for now, this is Crown Jewel. It opened up with, of course... Hell in a Cell with this long-time rivalry between Seth Rollins and, of course, Edge. As you know, there, there's been back and forth, you know, with both of them, you know, trying to end each other's misery. And it, this is like a never-ending story. Now, I know some WWE fans get sick and tired of the same old things. I mean, this is how it is, but it, that's how it is. But I think the cage, the Hell in a Cell match was more like, Edge knows this is only one, way, the only way possibly the shut of Seth Rollins up, and you probably wouldn't expect it. But he pulled the unexpected when he stomped Seth Rollins and allowing himself to pin him one, two, three, and that it's all she wrote, folks. Now, our next match we have Mustafa Ali, and of course, Saudi Arabian uh, hometown hero Mansoor. As you know, they used to be tag team partners. And now they're like bitter enemies. They're going back and forth. Now, Mansoor has been very impressive. Even when he was on 205 Live, and I'm not sure about NXT. But it was great that he was there. But uh, he now has to deal with Mustafa Ali. Uh, if you guys know this, they're both Middle Easterns, but they're not from the same country. You know, Mustafa's family, I think, is originally from Pakistan. While well, Mansoor, he's from Saudi Arabia. But what I liked is how Mansoor was able to pull up a quick victory on Mustafa Ali. But later, Mustafa Ali was not a happy camper for what happened. But the one thing that was surprising, a mysterious figure in a karate gi shows up. Named, uh, what's his name? Named Targay Hamade, who turns out to be a gold medalist from the Tokyo Olympics, appeared and gave him a... Really amazing fast kick to Mustafa Ali's face. And I think it showed. Now, some of you probably saying, don't you think they're going a little bit over the board? I don't know. I don't know if WWE have an interest in him because, A, he's a gold medalist. That is like a definite plus for WWE for them. Don't forget, we have Kurt Angle, who's a gold medalist. And now we have this other dude, I forgot his name, who's a, uh, who's a gold medalist. I, I, that's how I see it. But this guy's silver. I don't think it makes a difference. Now, our next match, 
we have is the Raw Tag Team titles between AJ Styles and Amis, who were the previous tag champions for Raw, taking on Arcade Bro. Yes. So here, but I think the best moment in, in the opening part of the of the of the entrance, as you know, Riddle likes to show up in a scooter. But however, he came out in style. If you're in Saudi Arabia, you know you have to come in style. He came out on a camel. <laughs> so I think that was like one of the most really best moments I've seen. I, I couldn't stop laughing. I just enjoyed it. I mean, not to insult the Middle Eastern people. I just think it's just too sort amazing that Riddle's like saying, hey, I'm in Saudi Arabia. Why not? You know? So I think it, it felt like he's wants to show up in style. But of course, Randy's like, you must be out of your mind. But anyway, the match was really okay. It was okay. I mean, it was, but I think the ending was more impressive when you saw where AJ was about to do the springboard uh, onto Randy, but he pulled it off with the RKO and allowing for Riddle to do a moonsault in order to finish off the match and allowing them to retain the titles, which is really awesome. Now, our next match is the Queen's Crown 2020 final match between Zelina Vega and Dewdrop. Now, I can say this. I have been spoken about Zelina Vega before in the past. As you know, I, I said this. I just hope WWE do not screw this up. I know there's been criticism by fans who are saying, why are they allowing her to lose matches ever since? There are those that were, of course, saying maybe because they want to punish her for what her husband did. You know, I'm talking about... Malachi Black, you know, going to AEW as soon as his 30-day non-compete clause was finished and, you know, and all that. So, but I think, I, I think, I think many fans probably say maybe we feel okay. I mean, not to take away Dewdrop, I mean, she is a fun character, not to mention her being the sidekick to Eva Marie now striking on her zone, going all the way to the finals to the crown. Queen's Crown is something special. I think these two deserved it to be in the finals, but I think in the end, having Zelina Vega win the um, the Queen's Crown fits perfectly. And I think many fans will love to see her succeed more. But like I said before, WWE better not drop the ball on this one with them. I know I said, look, at least she should just have one title reign as a either a, I think she's in SmackDown right if she's in SmackDown she should get a shot of the dub of the SmackDown women's title and that's something we have talked about but let's just hope they don't screw this one up next match this was a grudge match became a no holds barred fall count anywhere match between Bobby Lashley and Goldberg now this match goes back all the way to SummerSlam um, as you know, Goldberg had to couldn't continue on due to an injury he obtained at the match, and of course Lashley continues to attack him. And then of course he put the hurt business on the hurt lock on his son Gage, and of course MVP being the the dumbest person ever saying it could have been anybody. He's like, no, this is his son, and he swore to him he was coming after him. But the match was so intense, like Goldberg went to a different side of him that we never have seen in years he took out oh even her business showed up and they got their butts handed to him but what think but what makes it so interesting is how he ended the match where he speared him 15 feet down to a table and he was down and allowing for goldberg to pick up the victory and of course the ending he goes straight to where the kids were sitting hugging them i think he I think what I like what the commentators are saying, when he looks at these kids, it reminds him of, of his son. And I think that's a much emotional thing to, to see. You know, I think it's kind of telling his son, I did this for you. So it was a good match. But of course, what the Almighty is going to think as soon as he gets back to the States. I don't know. Hopefully, this is just going to end or I don't know. Now we get to the finals of King of the Ring 2020. We got... Xavier Woods versus Finn Balor. Now, I'm a fan of these two guys. I have met Xavier before in Comic-Con. Nice guy. Finn Balor, I always will be a fan of him. 
when he first arrived in WWE, but later I known about him a career back in New Japan when he was known as Prince Devet. I have to say, phenomenal match. Great, but I think I was biased on this one. Because to me, I don't think it mattered who was going to walk out as long as they're the ones who earned this winning match for the King of the Ring. And I think that's it. But I was surprised it was Xavier Woods, how he did it. And I think it played out pretty well because I think none of us would have expected. I know maybe there are certain fans that probably would have preferred Finn Balor. But it went it, it ended with... Xavier Woods, and I think he earned the right to be the king of the ring. Now, our next match is a title match. It's the WWE title between Drew McIntyre and Big E. Now, this is like one of those matches where Drew McIntyre is wants to get back on the hunt for WWE. He wasn't even allowed to get another shot since he lost to Bobby Lashley. But now he's back on that trying to get... And I think this is one of those matches that shows like Biggie wants to prove that he can still hang with the big boys. I know many fans were happy that he won the WWE title from uh, Bobby Lashley. And I think it was pretty amazing how he did it. But now it's like, okay, Drew McIntyre wants to obtain it. And I think it felt naturally. And I think the biggest surprise is how Biggie did it. How he beat Drew McIntyre. So he retained the title. But however... Do we see in this scenario, now that he beat Drew McIntyre, do we see Drew McIntyre going back into a heel? It's a possibility. But it all depends on how WWE wants to turn it around. It wouldn't be surprising for me. But we'll just wait and see. Our next match is a triple threat match for the SmackDown women's title between Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, and Sasha Banks. Now, if we go back to SummerSlam, as you know, we were originally supposed to have Bianca Belair putting uh, putting her title on the line against Sasha, but Sasha wasn't there, and then here comes Becky Lynch. So at some point, the the Almighty made the decision to put this into a triple threat match, and it was like, I think, okay, I don't think it makes a difference anyway. I mean, we saw the man came back in SummerSlam taking the title, but now it's like, Okay, how this is going to play out. Now, I know there's been a lot of talk saying they want to see Becky Lynch as a heel, the, the WWE creative team. But come on, we've seen that maneuver done before. It didn't work. But I think I like how she ended the match where she pulled up a roll-up on Bianca Belair and grabbing the rope to retain the title. I, I think I'm not sure. I mean, I know this is something that nobody, nobody can see. Can we just make Becky Lynch a tweener? I mean, I'm a big fan of tweeners. So, uh, if you guys don't know what tweener is, I'll explain that to you at the end of the episode. Because that is something, you know, probably nobody knows about. Now, our next match, the Universal title. This is between Roman Reigns against Brock Lesnar. Now, this, they have come across each other in the past. However, as you know what happened during the contract signing, Brock Lesnar said he read the contract with his advocate, which is currently the advocate of Roman Reigns. Now, was Brock Lesnar playing mind games? Who knows? That is like the unanswered question. But I think it was showing how good this match was it because you can tell Roman Reigns is becoming the unbeatable. No one can stop him. Not even Finn Balor could do it. Nobody. But I think what the best moment is, is when what how... Paul Heyman tossed the belt. He tossed it right in the middle between Brock and Roman. So the real question is, was who is he being a two-timer or whatever the scenario is? And I think it played out pretty well. And don't forget, he did have help from the Uzos, his cousins, to give him the help, help, helping hand and allowing for Roman Reigns to once again... the the head of the table to retain the title. So what do I think about um, Crown Jewel? I think it was pretty good. I think I, I enjoyed it. But even though I don't watch Raw or SmackDown, but I will explain to you guys at the end of the episode why I don't see it. So just stay with me. Uh, we'll continue more on this episode. So 
I say let's move on with AEW Rampage. Okay, so we got AEW Rampage for all of you. It opened up with the first round matches for the AEW World Title Eliminator. As you know, this is just the beginning. Whoever wins the finals, they're heading straight to full gear with either face Kenny Omega or Adam Hangman Page. So, the match was in fact Orange Cassidy versus Powerhouse Hobbs. Now, keep in mind, back in t last year, Orange Cassidy has beaten Powerhouse Hobbs. But now this time, Hobbs is prepared for the Orange Punch and he did everything possible. Now, the he was what I like how he was playing smart looking at the ribs that he was obtained by that he, orange cassidy obtained at that ladder match during the entire match matt hardy was watching he was hoping that powerhouse hobbs eliminates him but however it did not work he lost his temper when he referee bryce rittensburg tried to give the five count he wouldn't break out but he was about to lose his cool however hook tries to tell him Stay focused. Do not lose your focus. But however, because he did, you know, Rice Brinsburg was pissed for touching him. Not to mention he was distracted and allowed Orange Cassidy to pick up the victory. So that means he advances. But we'll see who will be facing next in the set, in the sort of semi rounds or whatever to call it. Now, recently we have witnessed we there was an interview with Penta and Seto Emin. Phoenix wasn't there because either he got hurt after what happened in the events of the trick that Andrade pulled on them, losing the AAA tag team titles. Apparently, the Super Ranas, or the Super Frogs, showed up. Another trap laid by the Pinnacle, by FTR. This time, they may have taken the AAA tag team titles. But now they're aiming for the AEW World Tag Team titles. But F Phoenix wasn't there to help his brother. Luckily for him, Pac showed up. Now our next match is a grudge match. A non-title match. Anna J versus Britt Baker. This was set up because of last week. Apparently the Dark Order were unable to beat the Super Click. And Britt Baker saying that the Dark Order are a bunch of losers. And that the Elite are the true team. Basically, she started this fight. The match was pretty good. I have to say, it showed a lot of development with Anna J, how she has grown. I mean, I know a lot of people love the Dark Order, but she has grown so much. She learned everything. She even applied the Queen Slayer on her, but however, the Lockjaw was placed on her. She had no other choice but to tap out. But however, Britt Baker decided to punish her more, but out of nowhere... Her best friend, Tay Conti, showed up to teach her lessons. And Britt Baker, I said this before, I knew that someone was going to challenge her no matter what. It didn't matter if there's a secondary title. Someone was going to challenge her, and that person is Tay Conti. So, looks like she may issue the challenge, or we'll see what happens. Because there's no way Britt will say that she's not even on her level. But, things can change from then on. Now, our main event... It's between Andrade El Idolo versus Pac. This is part two. Pa Andrade was 100% confident that he's going to win. The only reason he won the last time was because Chavo Guerrero decided to disobey direct orders from Andrade. And that's what he did. He fired him. But the match was incredibly awesome. I think it was one of the best matches I've seen so far on Rampage. But especially when it comes to Andrade and Pac facing off each other. But somehow, he put a, pulled an inside cradle on Andrade to pick up the victory on him really quickly. But however, once that pinfall happened, out of the blue, Malachi Black shows up and gives him the blackness. Now, they were about to punish him even further until Arn Anderson showed up, pulls out his gun. Well, not a real one, metaphorically. And then, boom, here comes Cody. Attacking Malachi Black, getting ready for their third installment in their latest feud. And this is going to be good. And I think this um, 
I have to say the main event was the best. I think it was one of the best ones I've seen so far, and I like it. So I think we can't wait to see what's going to happen tomorrow on AEW Dynamite. Okay, so 205 Live, once again, we have an tag, a, a women's tag team match. We have Amari Miller and Valentina Barras. Now, these two girls have faced off on opposite side of each other, but this time they're a team taking on uh, Ulisa Leon and Kat Katrina Cortez. Now, this was a very interesting dynamic because mostly I was paying attention to Amari and Valentina. Now, I said this before. They have faced off before. They one or the other won. Doesn't matter how. But seeing them work together, that's a different story. I think that showed they can put aside that part of their lot of their history and focus on the task at hand. I mean, we could see them potentially one day challenge for the NXT women's titles. And that is something we definitely can be proud of. And I think I can see that. Because the way I saw it, Valentina took out um, Katrina Cortez out in the ring while Mari Miller decided to put away Ulisa Leon out and putting her the one, two, three right on her. And I think it was a pretty good match. The next match we have is Malik Blade taking on Duke Hudson. As you know, Duke Hudson is very impressive. Uh, you know, was impressive when we first saw him on the NXT breakout tournament. But he always wins his matches as this one. Oh, excuse me. Oh. But I think it was a pretty good match. The next match was a much really cool match. Um, Jeet Rama versus Zion Quinn. Awesome match. I think this is one of those matches I feel has a great caliber. Because Jeet Rama is a... I think he has like an amateur wrestler background or so. And as for Zion Quinn, he looks more like he's disciplined. And I think it showed a lot of character in this one. They even uh, shook hands prior before the start of the match. And it showed sportsmanship. Even the same thing. But Zion Quinn will always be impressive. You know, the way he finishes off his opponents with knocking them out. And then one, two, three, it's over. And I think Zion, he is one of those wrestlers we definitely got to pay attention to. So... I think that's pretty much it with 205 Live. And I think right now I'm going to end reviewing with Pro Wrestling Noah. Okay, Pro Wrestling Noah. This is part of the crossover 2021 in Hiroshima. This took place on August 1st of this year. The opening match we have Kia Okada teaming up with Funky Express leader King Tani taking on King Tani's stable mates, the Funky Express consistent of Mohamed Yone and Akitoshi Sato. Now, this is one of those matches where it showed, okay, Mohamed never teams up with other people, especially he normally teams with, with Tane all the time, even before he became king. But seeing how Mohamed and Akitoshi, they both, uh, you know, really synced in. It showed a lot of good character with both of them. Despite the fact that you, when you look at Saito in the past, they actually were enemies, but now they're part of the same faction. And I think it showed a lot of character. I think Yone and, and Saito showed a lot of great potential teaming up together, despite that they're from two different worlds. But it worked. And of course, they had to take out the weakest link of the of the opposing team, um, Kia Oka, uh, Kenya Okada, thanks to Saito. Next match we have, of course, Kongo, uh, Tadasuke, and Aleha, who is one of the the newer members. Who I did not see his debut; it was I missed it. And of course, Keno taking on Junta. Miyawaka, Daiki Inaba, and Masa um, Kiramiya, if you, a former a Congo member. It was pretty good. I think it showed a more 
how can uh, can uh, Congo has been a more more cohesive unit. I'm a fan of Congo. You know, I love their the color red that fits into them, and not to mention them being a very cohesive unit. And not to mention, I for I failed to mention, Aleja is a junior heavyweight contender. So that means he, Tadasuke, Neo, and Haho are now there's about four people, four junior heavyweight contenders. You probably asked me how many do they have for heavyweight. Well, right now it's Keno, um, Malabo Soya, and of course, ah, uh, what's his name? Uh, Katsu Katsuhiro Nakajima. But right now, Congo with this com configuration, very impressive. Keno, this uh, panda, uh, what's his name? Which one he put? Oh yeah, he pinned uh, Junta, and it was already over. The moment he didn't realize, it was done. Now our next match, we have Los Perros del Mar de Japón, consistent of Kontaro Suzuki and I I uh, Kudo Hidaka taking on Stinger leader Yoshinaru Yoshinari Ogawa, and of course, a uh, young boy, one of the newer wrestlers are still in the learning curve, Yatsukak. Uh, Yatsu Taka Yano. Now, much of the match, I have seen how they were separating Yano away from Ogawa because it played a very smart tactic. And you can look at Yano, who is the weakest link in the team. Now, Ogawa is self-aware, and of course, he's on. Um, Yano is current was on a learning tree with. With Ogawa, I'm sure that Ogawa knows he did his best, but as you know, Ogawa, who's the leader singer, and those battles that Mad are their rivals. So, yeah. But it was um, Suzuki that put him in a submission and forced him to tap out. Next match, we got the other members of Congo. We have, of course, Niho, Haho, and Katsuhiko Nakajima taking on Sugi Uragun. Um, consisting of Kazuyuki Fuji, uh, Fujita, Kendo Kashin, and Takashi Siguria. Siguria, sorry. So anyway, but I have to say this. Once again, the cockiness of Kendo is may one day kick him out of Sugiira uh, Goon because he was the one who picked up the victory when he put away, um, I think it was Haho. Excuse me. <sighs> Haho. But of course, Kendo has an attitude problem, but he did it when he pulled him up a roll up and it was over right the moment it happened. Our next match is a tag team. No, it's a it's for the GA GHC, the Global Honor Crown Junior Heavyweight uh, tag team titles between uh, Stinger members Yuya Zuzumu and Seki Yoshi Yoshioka. Taking on the champions Hajime Ohara and Daisuke Arada. Now this team won these titles from Stinger not too long ago when it was Arada and Ogawa. Now Arada is currently the junior heavyweight champion, so this was a perfect opportunity, as you know that there's a bit of a feud between who will run the junior heavyweight division, and that kind of plays out in the in a good way because it, sh it tells us. The story, who is running the junior heavyweight contenders? Stinger has always been the dominant force in in the in the uh, junior Noahs, but somehow uh, Seki uh, Yoshioka was able to pick up the victory when he pinned o Ohara, his former teammate from Full Throttle, becoming the brand new GHC. Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions. Now our next match is a special match. We have Atsushi Koroge teaming with Kaito um, Kiyomiya taking on Nosawa Rongai of Los Perros del Mar de Japón and of course the legend, the myth man, the myth, the legend, the great Muta. The match was crazy. It was nuts. Even Kiyomiya was bleeding out. 
and the match ended in disqualification thanks to Muda, who missed the referee. But he decided to continue to torture Kiyomiya. Even uh, Yoshinari Ogawa from Stinger showed up to give him a helping hand, but he also got missed by Knife by Muda. So it's kind of strange to, to see now. What I failed to mention is Kiyomi, uh, Kiyomiya and Kiyomiya and Kiramiya are both tag team champions, the current ones. Somehow, um, but I don't know if he's considering having him join Stinger because mostly the Stinger wrestlers are part are junior heavyweight contenders. But we'll see what happens. Now our next match is for the GHC junior heavyweight title. Between better rivals, Yohei of Dos Perros del Mar de Japón, taking on Stingers, and the current champion, Hayata. It's so insane. Like, you can tell the termination from Yohei wants to be the champion and get even with Hayata for everything. Now, for those who don't know, Yohei used to be a member of, of Stinger until he was kicked out. But... He was nowhere near close enough to challenge to beat him, but eventually he will lose the title. Then we get to our main event, which is for the GHC heavyweight title between um, Sugiura Goon member uh, Kazushi Sakuraba taking on Ma uh, Naomichi Marifuji, who is the current who is the champion. It's so good. I think it showed a lot of character, a lot of technical catch wrestling style you probably wouldn't expect it but i think it was a good match it showed how mari fuji is a fighting champion despite the fact that you know during his old early years he was a junior heavy contender now he's a heavyweight but he wants to prove that he still got it and he wants to be a fighting champion which is good for him and good for everyone who's a fan of mari fuji especially me who has been fallen for years, but now we'll see where how far he's become as the current GAC heavyweight champion. So here's some news updates for all of you. I failed to mention this earlier. As you know, all women's promotion run by Thunder Rosa, Mission Pro Wrestling, has announced on their Twitter page a brand new championships. And this time is the tag team titles. And I was wondering when this was going to happen. Now, I, I have seen one event by Mission Pro Wrestling. It was good. They only had one title. Now there's two. So this is going to be a very interesting so I think some of you probably ask, are we going to see more? Depends. Right now, I think what Mission Pro Wrestling are doing right now, uh, displaying, showcasing a lot of women wrestlers. There's three shows I haven't seen yet from them, um, but I am determined to see those. I really am interested, you know, but we'll see about that. Now, I also met, failed to mention on the AEW Rampage, they finally announced the brackets for the AEW TBS title eliminator matches. This is how it's going to go. This is a little complicated. Right now, there's four women who have first round buys. Thunder Rosa, Jade Cargill, Nyla Rose, and Chris Statlander. So that's kind of interesting. But however, the first round matches, we're going to have Anna J versus Jamie Hayter. Whoever wins that match will face Thunder Rosa. Then there's the Bunny versus Red Velvet. Whoever wins that match will face Jade Cargill. Serena Deep versus Hikaru Shida. Whoever wins that faces Nyla Rose. Penelope Ford versus Ruby Soho will take on Chris Statlander. So this is one of those. This is an interesting how they set it up. And I think this just shows. I just saw Emi Sakura was disappointed that she didn't get in in the Eliminator. Well, I don't know. But uh, I have to say there's a lot of good women here that could win it up. The ones I'm paying attention right now is Donna Rosa, Jade Cargill, 
Ruby Soho, and possibly Nala Rose. So I think that that's one of the things I got to pay attention. But for now, let's just focus what's going to happen in the upcoming weeks for this title to, to take its place. But for now, let's just pay attention to what's going to take place on Dynamite. So I think that's it for now. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, you know, reviewing Crown Jewel. You know, normally I don't talk much about WWE Lexus NXT, but I'll explain a little bit about that. Of course, you guys probably enjoyed Rampage, 205 Live, and of course me reviewing a past event by Pro Wrestling Noah. Uh, coming up, we have, of course, um, Got to Move Pro Wrestling. We have Game Changer Wrestling with uh, Blood Sport 7, which I haven't seen yet. And, of course, we cannot forget about AEW Dynamite. I haven't decided if I want to throw in another wrestling event. But um, if we do, then I'll be the ones to throw in. Now, I'm going to explain to some of you why did I review WWE Crown Jewel. I'll explain to all of you about that earlier. I mentioned it. The reason I reviewed it is because, you know, like I said in time and time again in the past, um, I stopped watching Raw and SmackDown because it kind of got boring for me. I just didn't enjoy it like I used to in the past. Not until I started watching the independent shows, you know, like Ring of Honor, and then New Japan, all of that, until AW came around and changed that. But I have paid attention with NXT since the start of the of the um, NXT of the Wednesday Night War, and I still watch that, despite the fact. Um, but yeah, but if there's any important pay per views such as like this one, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, uh, possibly Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, that sort of thing, those I can uh, review for all of you. But that's who I am, and that that's how I feel, you know. I'm not doing this because I hate them. I just don't like what they've been doing recently with their product. And that kind of gets me off. Now, I did mention about what the hell is a tweener for all of you guys. So if you guys don't know what the tweener is, you're in between either a face or a heel. Now, you can be a face, but sometimes you can act like you're a heel. Or you're a heel who is pretending to be a face. So that kind of fits that. If you guys want a prime example of that, check out Queen's Quest from Stardom. They, those girls are tweeners and of course we had uh the dx when triple h took over when he had Pac, billy and road dog they were tweeners too so i've always been a big fan of the tweeners but uh we don't get that much of that but if i was a wrestler i'd probably be a tweener myself because i think i might enjoy it and i think the Ro world warriors in the past they have been tweeners before because they acted like good guys but in reality they were bad guys so that's possibly the philosophy about that. But we'll see when that day happens for that. But for now, I'll see you guys in the next DWZ time. Same DWZ channel. I must bid all of you adieu. So goodbye. Mwah. And have a nice day. Bang. <laughs>